Hello everybody, welcome to another episode of Crypto Café. My name is Fabrocas. Today I'm here with Malman and Kiku, the usual culprits. Say hello to everybody. Hello to everybody. Hello. Welcome. How's, yes. uh, how's the weekend going? So far so good? Ah, uh, it's very okay. fine. Yeah, so far so good. Very good. And you, Kiku? All good, man. All good. Busy, as usual. But... Easy going, easy going. Easy That's what going, you get when, when you work at Today... corporate, you see? Because Kiku works at corporate, so yeah. everything for him is easy going. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Today, well, today, it's always a question of perspective. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Yeah. Of course. <laughs> today, I could pay uh, an uh, beer mm -hmm. with crypto, so I'm a bit of drunk. And Fubroka is taking exactly, care of exactly. Mal Malman cannot handle a single beer, so everybody knows now. Malman. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's true. So uh, today we have a very special guest, uh, Edward, uh, from uh, directly from Brazil, although he's French, um, from Staking.com. Hello, Edward. How are you doing, buddy? Hi, guys. Doing great. Thanks for inviting me here. Uh, you're, yeah, you're very welcome, man. You're very welcome. How's uh, Brazil treating you? Uh, so far, so good. Uh, much warmer than in Portugal these days. Uh, oh, I heard. Chasing the summer. Exactly, exactly. So uh, now you're enjoying a, a, a summer winter, let's say. <laughs> a winter for us, summer for you. That's good, man. That's yeah, good. yeah. Part of the lucky ones. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But uh, before Brazil, you were living in Portugal, right? Yes, yes. Um, I'm actually uh, French Portuguese, uh, although I'm born and grew up in France. And mm -hmm. I like to spend a lot of time in Lisbon, uh, where actually I spend most, most of my time now, nowadays. Uh, yeah, I really like Lisbon and I really like the crypto community there. Uh, it's a good scene, a uh, good place to be. Yeah, I think so too. So you, you already know uh, a lot of people working in crypto in Lisbon, right? Yeah, it's a very interesting ecosystem. Uh, and lots of people coming and going too. Uh, I mean, we've all met hundreds of people uh, with the conferences in, in the last few weeks. Uh, it was quite insane there. <laughs> yeah, yeah it's, that's how we met, by the way, um, uh, at uh, one of the after parties. Um, to be honest, I don't remember which one, but uh, it, was a, it, was, it was okay. It was a nice party, uh, free alcohol, you know. It, it's always good. It's always good. <laughs> um, and I've, I, I didn't go to that once. Every every party where I go, we have yeah, no. Play. That, that's <laughs> because you're not in Lisbon. <laughs> Exactly, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> if you have to pay, it's not crypto. crypto. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's another kind of party. It's exactly, it's not a crypto party. Uh, you're right, at the crypto party, somebody, somebody else always pays it. You're right. <laughs> uh, and uh, tell us, Edward, how did you, did you go into crypto? Before, like, you know, Lisbon, before everything, how, how did you find crypto? Or, or where do you were at Lisbon already? Uh, I think I started my, my, my crypto adventure in around 2017. Uh, back then, I was working in banking. Okay. Uh, come from uh, finance uh, and banking background. I uh, worked uh, a while in mergers and acquisition and private equity uh, for uh, banks in France and uh, UK. Okay. Um, and I've always been interested uh, into finance uh, and tech technology and innovation. And I think that's what naturally brought me uh, to leave banking uh, for blockchain and crypto, uh, which is, you know, it's, it's just like the new finance and also uh, the new web internet. And I really find the whole space very interesting. So um, I started by uh, a project that uh, was building a decentralized financial product uh, called uh, Trax.io. Uh, Trax.io, okay. So, yeah, I started uh, T-R-A-K-X, uh, started this project uh, in 2017 or so. Uh, we raised a seed round with uh, consensus uh, to make a kind of fully regulated platform uh, for institutionals that would offer regulated decentralized financial products uh, that we call crypto traded indices. Uh, so yep. it's uh, kind of what token set does, but with a more like institutional or uh, regulated approach, uh, if you'd like. Was that before so, yeah. set protocol even? I think we kind of started at the same time and we even started like integrate, we even integrated some of the libraries uh, and code. Oh, nice. So, and the product, which uh, launched uh, recently. I, I'm not part of the team anymore. Uh, so 
you know, okay. launch wasn't mine. But the product which launched uh, recently, I think, uh, yeah, launched after uh, set protocol. Uh, so, uh, I mean, it's. I, I wouldn't say that it came before set protocol. Uh, so yeah, I worked on this project for a few years. Um, I was CEO and co-founder there, and you know, while working on this project, uh, I was also operating uh, nodes for some of my proof of stake assets, mm -hmm. and that's how I got started with staking, uh, which uh, started as a side project with uh, my co-founder Thiago. Uh, about three years ago, um, we were just operating nodes uh, for ourselves, basically. Um, to, we had chosen an operator back then on a uh, proof of stake asset called Tezos, and they were not paying uh, rewards uh, adequately. Okay. Uh, so we felt like <laughs> we would do a better job uh, doing it ourselves. Um, <laughs> and then we expanded to more proof of stake assets because we really wanted yeah. to. Uh, support that emerging ecosystem uh, as we find it more uh, efficient uh, than proof of work and a solid like alternative or uh, let's say um, so something very complementary uh, to uh, proof of work. Go on, keep before on. We, we, yeah, yeah, just because yeah, just before we we jump into uh, more of the proof of stake part of this, uh, you said that you were working in well traditional banking uh, and financial systems uh, before. Uh, I was just going to ask if you, if, I, if you would like to talk about this, what drew you to, to crypto? And why did you change back then? Do you regret it? Oh, <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> no it would be funny, I mean... Edward, Edward. It would be very funny if you say if you have said yes. I would love, I would love. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I regret it. No, no, no. Have you ever on. met somebody regretting that? No, thing. of course. <laughs> I hate crypto. No, no. <laughs> that would have been funny. <laughs> Sorry, no, I think what brought me to here was first, like, I, I mean, I'm probably more of an entrepreneur uh, than... Uh, an employee and there's just so many things to build uh, <laughs> in the crypto space uh, that and you know it was, it's also like finance related I love finance um, so it was kind of a natural sure. move uh, I think if you want to actually build anything in, in, in finance today uh, whether you go for like one of these consumer app or reg tech because a lot of the traditional financial world now is basically compliance businesses, uh, or are you going to crypto? Because that, that's where the innovation is happening. And everything that is being built right now in, in crypto is just so much more efficient uh, than the past uh, systems. Uh, and yeah, this, I mean, it's just make it so, so interesting. Uh, so uh, it, it was a very natural, uh, natural move. Uh, I don't regret it at all. I think I could have done like that nice little financial <laughs> career that a lot of uh, guys appreciate. But uh, yeah, I, I have more the hacker mindset uh, than uh, the. Fair enough. <laughs> it wasn't for you. Yeah. And, and the space. Thanks to I guess you. Uh, well, I guess I I thank the space too. <laughs> <laughs> And come on, look at that culture. Like I really love that wag me mindset uh, that doesn't exist in many industries today. Uh, hmm. Everybody helps each other. We're all building together. We're all, you know, we're not competing against each other. We're just building good products uh, and bringing blockchain out to the world uh, in order to have more adopters and more adoption. Uh, it's it's very nice. Um, okay, so um, I mean, uh, Edward, you, you've been here since 2017. I mean, so you saw the dawn of DeFi. Basically, that's one of the things that brought you in, the dawn of decentralized finance. Um, I, I wanted your opinion on how do you see the space, the DeFi space, how, how it has evolved since 2017, and what do you think it's still missing from DeFi or the products that still need to be built? Yeah, yeah, no, it's definitely uh, DeFi uh, that. Uh... Kind of brought me uh, into blockchain, or the dawn of DeFi was still not called DeFi uh, back then, or it, it didn't have yet that that nickname. Yep. Uh, sure, but uh, yeah, everybody was talking about you know how we could make uh, financial transactions uh, more efficient uh, by using smart contracts and build uh, projects on top of each other. 
uh, old kind of money, money Lego uh, kind exactly. of thing. Uh, and um, yeah, so I got into got into DeFi building uh, crypto trading indices, and then got into DeFi building staking projects, which are also somehow part of the whole uh, DeFi ecosystem. Mm -hmm. um, I think now what is missing into DeFi is uh, a whole range of uh, whether institutional facing or consumer facing products uh, that kind of abstract uh, the whole blockchain layer. Okay. Uh, there are lots of, I mean, it's super nice. I, I, I love, we are all into blockchain and we love like to interact with uh, our, our wallets and connect to any application. But I think in the future, uh, probably you, so there'll be like a large set of users that don't necessarily, you know, interact using wallets, but uh, rather, uh, you know, any kind of application uh, to access all of their, their DeFi products uh, or like yield yield uh, saving accounts uh even taking part into like farming opportunities without necessarily having to go through the crypto ux which i find amazing but i understand a lot of uh potential users don't necessarily uh like it and there's always like a lot of risks uh, attached to it uh which needs which means that people need some kind of like a tech uh, background even if it seems easy there's so many risks uh, still attached to uh, the current DeFi UX. Um, so this kind of application, that definitely is something that has to be built. And, and we see some very nice one uh, emerging. Uh, there's one in the US that I really like. It's called uh, Outlet Finance. Uh, the guys, they offer uh, basically savings uh, connected to uh, Anchor Protocol, uh, which is uh, built on top of Terra Money, where uh, you can have like basically around 20% uh, annual yield on your uh, US dollars. But the whole like DeFi aspect of getting like sta into stable coins and interacting with a blockchain mm -hmm. wallet is kind of abstracted uh, for the hand user. Uh, so that, that's what I mean by uh, like seamless uh, UX friendly uh, applications. Um, I think we still need to see also more uh, decentralized bridges. Mm -hmm uh <laughs> that's a that's a very <laughs> tough question i would say because we just had like on the last podcast a very interesting discussion um about the difference between atomic swaps and bridges and uh, we kind of reached the conclusion or at least a um, a conclusion during during the discussion because we didn't we didn't do any like you know proper research before mm -hmm. or after anyways but uh, that any no, none of us <laughs> at least none of us <laughs> knew of any bridge that was properly decentralized basically um I, so, I don't know any yet as well uh, okay so that, that's a big problem. Like, edward just confirm everybody stop <laughs> please because edward just confirmed there's no bridge at all uh, ever and uh, there will no, never be I, a bridge i'm kidding, I'm I, kidding. I mean that <laughs> depends which degree of decentralization right? sure uh, sure, 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 sure. Right uh, at least now, not, like... not, like, not fully decentralized like atomic swaps, right? Um, where th there will be some kind of counterparty, let's say. Yes, yes. So far, I haven't seen like many like decentralized bridges uh, options, uh, but they're starting to emerge. But yeah, right now. What do you think? What I... do you think is the problem actually? Because because I just want to pick your brains, man. You're working on the space, so actually, your opinion might be quite interesting. <laughs> Well, it's still experimental technology. Okay. Um, I see two interesting decentralized or somehow decentralized bridges emerging. Uh, one, we're actually operating on their testnet at staking. It's called uh, D Bridge. D Bridge, um, yeah. It's quite interesting. Uh, it's going to be progressively decentralized. Uh, even like, I think mainnet won't launch as a fully decentralized uh, bridge, but in the future, it will be like a permissionless network where you know, a large set of validators can compete to get into uh, the active set and operate uh, decentralized infrastructure for the bridge uh, across okay. like a whole range of blockchains. Uh, so that's a very interesting one. There's wormhole crypto. Uh, that's an interesting uh, emerging bridge solution to, and they're already live on mainnet, but it's still a proof of authority network uh, with a selected right data set. But I think we're getting there. Um, the risk with like the current bridge solutions is they're basically like 
somehow a single point of failure. Like yeah, we, a lot of the bridges that that most of the people use, they're basically like centralized exchanges. Uh, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. You need to send the tokens to a smart contract that the the they operate and they mint the new con the new token basically on the on the on the chain. But they still they still control the token basically. It's it's a so, ma major yeah. risk. It's a major risk. Yep, yep, yep. Uh, yep. It's just right a now, centralized but, exchange basically. You're right. We're, we're, right. we're gonna get there. We're gonna get there. Interoperability mm -hmm. is a new theme. Uh, there's some interesting like interoperability happening in the Cosmos ecosystem with tender means tender mean base chains. In, in, in the Polkadot ecosystem as well, but then I think we still need also to connect like these ecosystems uh, between each other, and that's yeah, where but, we need but, like uh, these decentralized bridges. Like from Rocker said, uh, we we already discussed that that question. And um, okay, uh, between Cosmos ecosystems, makes sense that they have uh, easy to reach because it's all on the same mm -hmm. uh, protocol. Mm -hmm. But how, how do you bridge, for example? Uh, Ethereum uh, with Binance Smart Chain uh, in a de decentralized way. We don't uh, we don't find any decentralized uh, option. You there. need many people. So so I think correct me if I'm wrong, Edward. But the idea is like is similar to uh, like you know staking pools, right? So you need the set of validators, right? It's not it's not only one entity, but it's a group of entities, right? So the risk yes. is spread across. Yes, you know, that, many, that's many what you need to we need to build yep. all together. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So. A kind of a multi sig to yeah. control the, the smart contract. Something like okay. that. Some, not that, but something similar. Basically, it's more. It's more. I, I would say it's closer to delegated proof of stake, where you can choose. You know, let's say validators. Well, not. But but there would need to be some randomization process between the the, the validator who gets to to validate the set of data by taking a specific time. It's like consensus, right? So it's a form of consensus. I would say. Mm -hmm, okay. Definitely, definitely. That's that's what I mean by, by like building decentralized bridges. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, th that's I, where we I come agree. in uh, as as a company. Like that's where our, our background is. Is like to run infrastructure for proof of stake mm -hmm. networks. And exactly. We all can now. We're also like running infrastructure for decentralized bridge networks that uh, are looking to implement uh, some kind of proof of stake mechanism and being permissionless in the future and connected like to multiple chains where you'll be able to bridge between PSC, ETH, Solana, uh, mm -hmm. etc. So, and uh, talk us a little bit more, more about staking because, um, I mean, uh, right now you guys have about, uh, uh, well, a little over a billion dollars under assets under delegations or assets under management and um, mm -hmm. just over, or, or close to 12,000 stakers. Um, I mean, it's, those, those numbers are huge. So congratulations, by the way. Um, how did the company start? I mean, you already spoke about the, the company start, but how did it, how, how has it been involving from like you know a sidekick project, let's say, to like you know a major player in the staking ecosystem? Uh, well, I, th I think we have a passionate team, uh, so things kind of evolved very naturally from you know a side project to uh, everybody being full time uh, on it and the team growing, and with the whole. Uh, ecosystem growing as well. Uh, it's it's just been happening like very very, very naturally somehow. Like this has been we started you know uh, on a few networks, but then we started building some expertise on like Cosmos and Tender based blockchains, and there have been more blockchains looking to uh, onboard like serious validators with good track record, uh, good infrastructure. Um, so we get. Uh, I would say demand uh, from like emerging networks for uh, staking to operate on them. Uh, ourselves, we're also like explore new networks uh, that we find innovative and uh, could like uh, fill a gap uh, in the crypto ecosystem. And lately, we've been uh, exploring uh, like some. Uh, networks working on uh, ecological solutions or uh, the bridge networks uh, that we've talked about. Um, and then we also started like growing a portfolio of uh, institutional customers and uh, filling their needs. And they're always looking to uh, potentially integrate uh, more assets uh, to generate yield for their own customers. Uh, and that's where we can help them uh, providing infrastructure and also guiding them through uh, the risk and rewards on, on each blockchain. What uh, what coins do you support? Uh, what's the most common 
Bitcoin that you offer to your customers? Um, what and the, what type of coins, by the way? You, you already re uh, responded off of it. So. That's a good question. So we're non-custodial staking service provider, so we never um, have control over the assets of our clients, and that can uh, sometimes limit uh, some of the coins that we we, we can support. Uh, and we only operate on proof of stake consensus uh, kind of staking. So we don't offer, uh, you know, staking services for uh, coins that don't require uh, validator infrastructure uh, like uh, Sushi or Aave, uh, for example. Uh, not, we don't support like staking for dApps. We only support uh, proof of stake. Uh, cryptocurrencies uh, that have like a proof of stake co consensus uh, algorithm and we support like some layer ones some layer twos uh, among the networks that we support so we have the full list on the website that uh, keeps on growing uh, but to give you an idea uh, some of the big names uh, include solana uh, cosmos and a uh, large uh, chunk of the Tendermint base slash Cosmos uh, ecosystem, uh, Polkadot and uh, Kusama and other blockchains uh, in the Polkadot ecosystem, uh, as well as Near, uh, Mina, uh, Polygon. Uh, nice. We're also expanding to Ethereum now, uh, on which we we had not launched yet. Ethereum is uh, is proof of stake already. Uh, the Beacon Chain uh, is is proof okay. of stake. Uh, and we're expecting the merge to happen sometime around June twenty twenty two, and hopefully the Ethereum itself will will become a proof of stake network. And out of curiosity, Edward. Um, why don't you support uh, staking smart contracts, um, or do you plan one day to support them as well? Um, it's not our expertise. Um, I would say it's a very different uh, model. Okay. Uh, that we would need like to build a different product, a different platform. Absolutely. Uh, sure. Yes. It's it, it's still called staking uh, because now, well, staking, which used to be uh, just for like the proof of stake protocols itself, ended up being a term that now means mm -hmm. basically locking your coins to get a yield. And exactly. The validation aspect now is optional, but ourselves, we're focused on the validation aspect. That, that's okay. uh, our expertise is really to run infrastructure to validate, create blocks, uh, maintain the blockchain. Um, and yeah, for all the other kinds of staking, whether we would need like a custodian license and to have like control over the assets of our clients to offer like some kind of nice uh, user experience. Uh, or for the, for the dApps, like yeah, it becomes more of a smart contract uh, kind of approach. It, it's visible that's something we, we uh, get on working, but that that's really different from from what we do. No, and I fully understand. You're basically focused on on consensus on validating actual proof of stake networks. Um, yeah, makes sense. By the way, you talk a few coins that you support. Uh, you did say that mm -hmm. you only support proof of stake coins uh, in the. The ones that have uh, both proof of stake and proof of work, like to create, you have uh, anything like that? Uh, not right now. Uh, no. Okay. Um, and by the way, how do your customers pay 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 to you? Um, so the way it works um, is that on each network on where staking operates, uh, we set a commission fee uh, on the blockchain. And by staking with us, uh, customers they can generate uh, a yield from five to twenty percent in average, or even like fifty percent per year on, on on some blockchains. But that's based on the inflation rate of the network. Mm -hmm. um, and out of this yield, uh, we would typically take like a uh, commission fee ranging from like three to ten percent uh, in, in average. Uh, it's usually the blockchain that pays uh, the client directly uh, and also pays us directly. Like we do not uh, act as a middleman in the way that you know we would re first receive the yield and then pay out uh, mm -hmm. the rewards. Uh, it's usually directly automated at, at the protocol uh, level. Okay, so that that basically 
takes out uh, most of the risk basically of hacks and stuff like that uh, yeah, because it, yeah it, we really don't touch any we don't touch the assets of the band we, we have no mm -hmm. control over these and even the rewards uh, except on one protocol called tezos uh, mm -hmm. um, and um, that we're actually discontinuing uh, uh, except on this one uh, it's it, it tends to be automated at the protocol level yeah but that, that's pretty that's pretty cool and th that's obviously one of the the major difference between um you know smart contract uh, staking and protocol staking obviously um yeah that, that makes sense and that takes out most of the risk of hacks and you know security issues um so the users if i get this correctly um to clarify for for the listeners but basically the users can choose to delegate to you at any time and, um, and take out the delegation at any time as well basically stop delegating. yes yes okay. it's a fully permissionless service um so Today we have about uh, thirteen thousand delegators, uh, and interestingly, well, there's uh, a few institutionals that we know, but there's also like a lot of uh, individual token holders, uh, and and sometimes la large token holders that delegate to us, and we don't know them uh, because it's fully permissionless, um, and basically they can delegate, uh, undelegate whenever they want. Uh, there is, uh, depending on each protocol, uh, some uh, parameters to take into consideration, uh, such as the unbonding period, which is something set mm -hmm. at the protocol level, like we cannot uh, interfere with it or reduce it or increase it. Uh, sometimes it can take a few days uh, to get back uh, your tokens uh, if you, you were staking this, or it's usually like, uh, seven days to 21 days, uh, depending on the protocol. And there are risks also to take into consideration. And that's why uh, stakers uh, have to do a proper due diligence when choosing their validators uh, to make sure that these... Uh, they can be slushed of their, their coins. Yes, yeah? yes. That's part of the risks. Uh, that's, uh, I think after the liquidity risk, that's uh, really one to take into consideration as well. Uh, if the validator doesn't behave correctly, uh, tries to deliberately attack the network, uh, double signs, or uh, uh, has like an extended period of downtime. There are like some uh, slashing risks uh, that can range from like a very slight 0.0001% uh, of the assets slashed uh, to sometimes up to five or, or more percent. Okay, and that basically that, that, that risk is allocated to you, right? Because you are the, the guys running the infrastructure. So if something, let's say if, they, if, if the services go down for some reason um, and the, the coins can, could get slashed, right? Yes, yes, definitely. That's part of the risk. And uh, that's why we maintain like, uh, 24-7 uh, monitoring mm -hmm. and uh, alerting processes. Uh, we have redundancy at like the sentry and validator level. Uh, mm -hmm. We really try to do our best uh, so that such events uh, do not take place. Of course, of course. Um, I mean, uh, uh, like. Uh... I mean, I, I hope you don't mind me asking. Uh, have you ever had like a, an, like a slashing issue or an event where where coins were slashed? It's, it's a good question. So far on mainnet, uh, we've never been slashed. Uh, although I know some very serious validators that have been. You know, sometimes these are experimental networks. Uh, of course. So sometimes really, it's not necessarily the, the fault of the validator. And mm -hmm. we've even seen cases where validators would get slashed on mainnet and then like the whole community would agree that it wasn't the case of the validator and then uh, we would put like some on-chain governance or motion mm -hmm. uh, sure. so that uh, the validator himself and his delegators get, get compensated by the whole network because yeah uh, so sometimes it can happen. Out of curiosity, out of curiosity, when Solana went offline, some validators got slashed because of that? Uh, no, because Solana no. hasn't implemented uh, downtime slashing yet. Okay. Uh, there is uh, some manual uh, double sign slashing uh, that, that can be uh, triggered, I believe. Uh, but there's no like automated slashing policies on, on Solana right now. Mm -hmm. Okay. Since we are talking about uh, staking and proof of stake coins, um, and since you are um, validate your uh, customers, you are the validator. Don't you think that you can be a point of centralization of the network? Um, that's actually a very good uh, point. Um, I mean, 
when we take a look at uh, a lot of the proof of stake networks, uh, well, we you can get like a lot of data about uh, how much voting power uh, each uh, validator has, um, and there are definitely some networks where some validators have a lot of voting power. Uh, sometimes ten percent, sometimes twenty percent, sometimes thirty percent. That that's something we see in mining too, uh, right? The, mm -hmm, uh, exactly. Yes, on the tools. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So there's definitely like uh, some level of centralization. Uh, although, like most of the proof of stake networks, I, I believe, uh, are, are decentralized, uh, at least among the big ones, uh, both in number of validators. Uh, so typically, the set is like. 50 to 100, uh, up to like 1,000 or more uh, validators. Uh, and also like in voting power, um, although the, there are a few where, let's say, if the three major validators or the four major validators on, on, on those networks are down, then uh, the, the network itself uh, could, could, be, could be down. Um, but our, ourself, like I would say, well, we do not tend uh, to be like among the, the largest validators, uh, usually like among the top 10 on, on a lot of networks uh, or 20, but uh, I, I see ourselves more as contributing to decentralization uh, than uh, actually uh, centralization. Uh, but yeah, there, there's definitely some uh, level of centralization. I think it's also up to the delegator themselves to take this into consideration uh, and to the community and foundations to take appropriate measures to make sure that uh, delegators themselves are able to, to uh, take this into consideration. A lot of times uh, we notice, for example, on explorers, uh, explorers, they tend to rank the validators by voting power. And delegators, sometimes they're not necessarily educated on uh, decentralization. Uh, so instead of doing like a long due diligence, what they naturally do is that they select uh, a validator among the largest one or among the first ones to show up on the Explorer. Yeah. Um, because that's, that's I mean, an it economic makes sense they want to minimize right? their due diligence time. And, exactly. And they, they want to get the most, the most fees as possible as well. I would say. Yes, yes, they, they, they believe that because the validator has the most voting power, then it's stressful. Uh, sure. But sometimes it's not necessarily the case. And that's not also in the interest of the network, right? It's, it's a bit of a pri prisoner dilemma, if you want, where the mm -hmm. delegator. Yeah, that's, a, that's a good question. That's a good point. Uh, I, I'm actually not very much on the proof of stake coins, I don't follow that much, but on a uh, proof of work, sometimes I see the community uh, try to ask the miners to migrate to smaller pools. Do you see the community of proof of stake coins doing that? Also? It really depends on the networks. Uh, where we see, for example, like on some networks, uh, they changed uh, the way that uh, validators uh, are being shown on the Explorer, uh, where they would, for example, uh, aggregate uh, all the largest ones into one row that uh, the delegator would have manually to uh, uh, click through and go through uh, in order to actually see these validators. And they would like, instead of rank ranking by voting power uh, or number of assets staked, they would rank them on other criteria or just randomize the set uh, being shown uh, yeah, just so that not delegators are invited themselves to to, to diversify, uh, and mm -hmm. we hear every day uh, on communities, uh, on uh, podcasts, on uh, uh, during conference. We, we, that, that's something that every everybody uh, wants to see happening. Right? We want to we want to see more more decentralization. Uh, we want to see a higher set of validators with. Uh, smaller voting power allocated to each validator uh, to diversify the risk, right? And we, we want to see validators in every region of the globe uh, running some on their own infra, some uh, on bare metal uh, with a 
diversified set of cloud providers and not only AWS. Uh, I, I think we're, we're going to get there, but uh, yeah, there's a lot of different layers of, of centralization. Do, do you believe, uh, let's say in 10 years, that proof of stake coin is going to be more or less centralized? Uh, that's a very good question. Think if I, say that um, <laughs> I, I don't think it will be more centralized. Uh, maybe it will be less, uh, or, or the centralization will start taking place at another level. Uh, if you look at uh, what's happening with liquid staking, for example, uh, you have liquid staking solutions that are emerging uh, that themselves they tend to maintain a diversified uh, set of validators uh, based on sometimes uh, algorithmic rules uh, where they delegate to a large set of validators taking into account the centralization criteria. Uh, for example, Marinette Finance on, on, on Solana uh, is one of those staking pools that delegates to a large set of validators. Everything is rational and is based like taking into account like this decentralization criteria or um, Lido uh, also has a large set of validators on Ethereum. Uh, and they're always looking into like getting more decentralized. Uh, so you, you see these taking solutions emerging and, and they do their, their diversify at the validator level, but at the same time, they tend to uh, grow themselves uh, and they tend to accumulate more and more uh, of uh, voting power. Uh, although they do not have it directly because they delegate it to validators, but that's like a new layer of, of centralization uh, that's starting to emerge. Uh, Maybe for the best because this, they do a good due diligence on validators, and they offer like a high value added service uh, to their uh, smart contract customers. Uh, but at the same time, uh, the, it's a winner take all market where you, when you are the largest uh, liquid staking provider, uh, you tend to be able to integrate in more DApps. You tend to have uh, tokens that are more liquid. Uh, and for all of these reasons, well, you also attract more users, and that's kind of a virtuous circle where uh, you can end up owning like a large uh, chunk of the voting power of the network. So we, we're seeing more decentralization at the validator level, uh, and we're also seeing like validators that are being more aware of their responsibilities and diversifying like their own uh, infrastructure, cloud providers, uh, and all these kind of things, and more validators entering the active set. But yet. Yeah, the decentralization is, is starting to emerge elsewhere, so it's it's hard to say. Uh, and probably in the future, will there be more projects emerging that we don't know yet? Uh, and and that that's the way it is, right? It's always like a constant constant fight for for decentralization. Exactly. Uh, yeah. On proof of work or proof of stake, it's the same thing. We are always fighting for decentralization. Always. <laughs> it's a very tough fight. Yeah. And our hardware wise is also hard, right? And that brings the decentralization level a bit down. Because uh, for many validators, you need uh, quite beefy hardware, right? Yeah, so, definitely. I mean, uh, yeah. I mean, depending on the blockchains. Uh, but yeah, on some, it, it can be a, a small barrier to entry. Uh, you don't need like yeah. a whole mining farm uh, to have a validator uh, business or to run your own validators, but on some blockchain, yeah, you need, let's say, like a, a good gaming computer equivalent. Uh, so like there's, there's some hardware requirements and, and you need, of course, like a good internet connection uh, with proper bandwidth. Yeah, sure. Up time, man. yeah. Regarding staking.com, you have uh, any more questions for Edward? Uh, regarding stating.com, let me think. I mean, I think we covered most of the stuff. Um, Edward, is there anything that, that you want to, to talk about that we that we haven't discussed about staking or, um, I mean, any, anything, anything at all? So, Something I mean, right now we're, we're always like improving our products, right? Uh, we've been but what features are, are you releasing soon, by the way? Well, we've been investing a lot of resources into uh, improving our uh, institutional uh, solutions. Um, so among like the projects we're currently working on, uh, we're uh, building like a full suite of uh, APIs for uh, our customers to track their holdings, uh, rewards, uh, yields uh, mm -hmm. across like 
the range of protocols that we cover, as well as like a front end interface with a dashboard uh, where they can track yeah, their addresses and yields. Uh, so that that's something we're currently working on uh, among uh, I think a few other projects. So we're also uh, looking into potentially uh, launching like a liquid staking solution uh, on Solana. Uh, so that's something we're exploring with uh, other validators uh, to kind of help to decentralize the set uh, and contribute to decentralization on this blockchain. Uh, what else are we currently working on? Uh, yeah, we're working on... When you search for a new project, uh, what do you take first in consideration? You look at the network or the community ratio and ask to list some, some, uh, some coin? What's the process there? Do you mean what's our process to uh, decide whether we should, we, we're going to support a new network? Yep. Yes. Yeah. Well, that's a good question. So uh, typically, like there are two processes. Uh, well, we have some customers that stake with us, and if we get significant demand for a new network that we don't support, uh, that is already launched, uh, we're going to take a look at it and potentially like deploy infrastructure uh, for this network. Uh, on the other end, the, our tech team is always uh, exploring uh, new test nets, uh, so networks that are not uh, yet launched. And I think it's during these, these test net phases uh, that uh, we kind of conduct our due diligence. Uh, we, we're able to get a you feel at the software, at the community, yeah. at uh, the network itself. And it really helps us decide, okay, should we go or not? And yeah, usually it's based on uh, technological criteria, uh, financial criteria. In, in the case that we, we would be the ones, uh, you know, uh, starting on a new network where it, it wouldn't be like an inbound uh, customer request. Okay, nice. By the way, uh, and about uh, your infrastructure, where do you have your nodes uh, for staking? You have uh, some location for it, or are you gonna or you try to spread it around the world? Uh, so we mostly run a, our infrastructure in uh, Western Europe, uh, Eastern Europe too, uh, and North America. Um, okay. So we do use like uh, five different. Uh, uh, providers uh, and yeah, we use like different uh, regions and different uh, also like when it's cloud, you know, we diversify among uh, availability zones uh, just to, you know, just to uh, kind of minimize downtime, uh, provide redundancy, uh, diversify our, our infrastructure and our, our spread our risks. Uh, that's, that's the goal. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Okay, uh, I'm good about staking. I really already learned about of about your product. Uh, if any of our listeners have uh, want to stake, they a lot of people like Solana nowadays. So go to staking.com and give it a try. I think it's it's worth it. You guys want to ask anything more to Edward? Actually. Just uh, like the the typical question that uh, that we like to ask our our guests at the end, Edward, uh, when was your uh, your uh, Bitcoin piece day or crypto piece day? So when when you spent crypto for for the first time, do you remember when I spent crypto in real life or to buy like some you know, digital stuff? <laughs> uh, Works both ways. Real, real life, life first, first but yeah. Sure. Works by the way, it's re real life first. But if you spend before on, I think uh, on real online, life, then... um, it, it took me a while because I'm kind of older, uh, and I, I mean, and is, I'm not 100% no, crypto, no, no. so I, I'd rather spend we, my we cash in my this crypto. Question. <laughs> <laughs> we ask these questions to every everyone we have here, in off of the people who never spend. Any no, crypto, but I, so. I, I did spend. Um, a few and the first time I, I remember i think it was in in new york and it was like super cold outside and uh, i hadn't like brought uh, uh, a coat uh, with me from from europe uh, it was like almost no just chilly chilly cold like almost snowing and i ended up like buying a coat uh using uh crypto uh so like i have a, a crypto debit card and that's that was like my 
Bitcoin moment. And, and it was, I mean, it was worth it because uh, at least uh, I was able to stay warm, but uh, it wasn't a wise financial decision. <laughs> <laughs> never is, man, never is. <laughs> so are we good? Yeah, I think so. Do you want yeah, to connect okay. anything Good. else? Uh, no, I mean, thanks for inviting me, guys. The listeners have uh, any any questions, uh, can reach out to me on, on Telegram uh, or Twitter uh, at uh, Edouard uh, L. You're going to give the, on the description of the oh, episode? Awesome, perfect. Yeah, yeah. any yeah. questions about staking, about uh, crypto, or if you just want to meet uh, somewhere in Lisbon or in Brazil or in Estonia, uh, <laughs> let me know, guys. <laughs> uh, thank you very much to, to be uh, with us, man. We, it was yeah, very thanks. nice. Thank, uh, thanks things. for accepting the, the invitation, Edward. It was a, a, a real pleasure to have you here, man. And um, I, I'm sure that our listeners will love you know, to hear about uh, staking and your experience with DeFi, uh, which has been awesome. So, and congrats on the project as well. Thank you, Thank guys. You. Have a good evening. Thank you. You too. Bye-bye. Thank you. See you next week, guys. E não se esqueçam de nos seguir na vossa plataforma favorita, seja ela qualquer podcatcher, Spotify, YouTube ou Library. Entrem na nossa comunidade crescente no Telegram ou sigam-nos no Twitter em CryptoCafePT e partilhem este episódio com os vossos amigos. Até para a semana!